Hi, everyone. I'm Tiara Smith, and I'm representing Beyond Type 1 and Beyond Type 2 here in the United States. It is an honor to be among all of you today. I was misdiagnosed with type 2 diabetes in 2017 and didn't receive my correct diagnosis of type 1 lot of diabetes until 2019. This is an experience I've come to learn is shared by many others, including close friends of mine. However, my experience has only strengthened my resolve to continue to advocate for people with diabetes and address stigmas and stereotypes, many of which of those people with type 2 and type 1 can identify. I'm excited for today because at last month's informal consultation of people living with diabetes, I got to see how energized and excited people were to lend our voices to solutions to improving the lives of people with diabetes around the globe. At the consultation, we all discussed the ways to be of service to the most vulnerable around us. And I'm excited to see that continue during today's panels, all of which I know that you'll enjoy. The objective of today's segment is to relay a message of urgency to the governments. In 2021, a substantial proportion of people around the world still cannot access insulin and other basic needs to manage diabetes. However, through this compact, we can reach our goals. And now I'll kick it off to my co-host, Nupur Lavani. Thank you, Tiara. Hello, everyone. My name is Nupur. I'm from India, and I represent the Blue Circle Diabetes Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization and support group living for people living with diabetes in India. I'm also associated with the Healthy India Alliance, the NCD Alliance, and the International Diabetes Federation. I've been living with type 1 diabetes for the past 26 years, and I'm a diabetes educator as well. Just like Tiara, I was part of the WHO's informal consultation on people living with diabetes, and it's an absolute honor to be here today and to welcome all of you to this wonderful segment for operationalizing meaningful engagement of people living with diabetes. Today is an important and historic day as we celebrate a collaborative way of going forward and embracing the window of opportunity of the centenary of the discovery of insulin, which is, as you all know, a life-saving drug for people living with diabetes like Tiara, me, and a million others. The objective of this segment today um, is to begin to alter the global narrative to a more values-based approach and look at commonalities and differences between type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and all the other types of diabetes in a mutually supportive and empowering way. With this, I would now like to call upon Dr. Svetlana Axelrod, who is the director of the Global NCD platform. Hello, colleagues, uh, distinguished uh, guests, and uh, your excellences. So thank you, our co-chairs, uh, Nupur and Tara, for opening the second segment of the Global Diabetes uh, Summit. I think it was a fantastic first segment when we had uh, head of states, ministers of health, head of UN agencies, and also my WHO colleagues who focused on a very important and very a specific issue on the diabetes. And of course, my highly appreciation to the Canada who are co-hosted for this event. So as it was said, I'm Svetlana Axelrod. I'm the director of the Global NCD platform. It's a division and a department in the headquarters in Geneva. And it's a great opportunity and pleasure for me uh, to organize the second segment of this Global Diabetes Summit, which will focus on the global, uh, which will focus on the implementation of the, and the continuation of the dialogue on the actions that we should do. So as it was mentioned before, the second segment will be mostly focusing on the moving uh, from the dialogue to the actions on the meaningful engagement of people living with diabetes in order to co-create this new global initiative, the Global Diabetes Compact. This builds on the long-standing priority of the global coordination mechanism, uh, which is working with the people 
uh, living with NCDs and WHO work is increasing focus on the leveraging these, the spirits and experience and networks of lived experience to achieve the global goals. So let me uh, proceed and to pass the floor to the video of our Director General of the WHO, Dr. Tedros, who will provide some opening remarks to the second segment of today's meeting. Excellencies, distinguished guests, dear colleagues and friends. The discovery of insulin is one of the greatest medical breakthroughs in history and has saved millions of lives. Yet, on the 100th anniversary of its discovery, millions of people who need insulin can't get it because it's not affordable or accessible. WHO's pre-qualification program for insulin aims to dramatically increase the affordability and accessibility of this life-saving medication. But that's not the only hurdle we face. Half of the adults with diabetes don't know their status and most of them live in low- and middle-income countries. This cannot continue if we wish to achieve our shared global goals. The best way to address these vast inequities is by working together to realize the principles of respect, dignity, and inclusiveness. The lived experience of people living with diabetes is essential for shaping the response to this disease in communities and countries. During the next two hours, you will be discussing how you can co-create and become essential partners and implementers of the Global Diabetes Compact. I look forward to hearing the outcomes from today's discussions and working with you as we go forward. I thank you. I think it was a really very powerful words from our Director General. And uh, of course, we know that uh, when people uh, and communities living and affected uh, by diabetes are engaged in the decision making and diabetes service delivery, more people living with diabetes gain access to treatment. So uh, I think that today's discussion and uh, our several panels will help us to understand better how we can work together, different communities, WHO, other UN agencies, civil society, private sector. So thank you again for this interesting and fantastic opportunity for us to be involved on this. And I hope that we will have a very productive discussion in a couple of hours. It will be not very boring for us, but I think it will be very, very fruitful. And thanks again to my colleague, Benton Mikkelsen, for this opportunity to be at the part of this discussion. So let me go back to our co-chairs and to ask them to continue our second segment. Thank you, over to you. Thank you, Director General, and thank you, Dr. Axelrod. Now, everyone, we're gonna be moving to our next discussion about our informal consultation on people living with diabetes. We're gonna recap this event from last month's uh, meeting. And we're going to start with Dr. Guy Fons, uh, Seren Farad, and Heather Kova. Excellent. Thank you so much, Tara and Nupur. And good day to all of you who are joining us from across the globe and, uh, and appreciate your time and, uh, and to join us. And, um, 
and discuss and help us shape this agenda forward. And uh, on behalf of the WHO's Global Coordination Mechanism on NCDs, it is my sincere pleasure to address you on this segment of the Global Diabetes Summit. But let me be clear from the start. The Global Diabetes Summit, and in particular, the global segment for operationalizing meaningful engagement, would not have been possible without the expert insights and contributions of people living with diabetes. As an example, in early March of this year, our team, together with the NCD department, co-organized an informal consultation with people living with diabetes. The aim of this consultation was to explore exactly how meaningful engagement of lived experience could become a guiding principle for the co-development of the long-term vision of the WHO's Global Diabetes Compact. The consultation was unique for many reasons, in particular because it used a participatory approach led and co-chaired across its three days by those with the lived experience of diabetes. Notable were innovative platforms used before and during the consultation to maximize, to maximize the participants' ability to convey their lived experience across the many representations convened and to do so effectively in, this, in, the, in our new virtual format and our new virtual world. Across those three days, we saw sustained engagement of 140 participants from 57 countries. The consultation uh, unpackaged the stark reality regarding the large gaps in access to diabetes treatment and care that continue to exist worldwide. But it also yielded rich insights on the importance of transitioning from mere storytelling to real and meaningful partnerships and action. And it provided valuable guidance on how to reframe and revitalize responsive narrative around diabetes. Let me uh, give you four key themes that were discussed in this consultation. First, participants were strong in supporting the message that patience is not a virtue when people are dying. 100 years since the discovery of insulin, access to diabetes treatment and care should not be a privilege. Second, people living with diabetes, in, uh, with diseases, sorry, including diabetes, are more than just storytellers. The Global Diabetes Compact will build an engagement framework that supports a transition from patient stories to incorporating people living with diabetes in partnerships, advocacy, implementation, governance, and beyond. People living with diabetes must be valued as experts. The value of lived experience must be better defined, formally acknowledged, and implemented through sustained and formal frameworks in order for the expertise of lived experience to impact and guide high-level decision-making processes. Third, for engagement to truly be meaningful, we need representation, diversity, and intersectionality. As part of any formal framework to include people living with diseases in decision-making processes, diversity must be acknowledged and guaranteed, particularly regarding geographical distribution, ethnicity, and culture, gender identity, sexual orientation, and comorbidities with other health diseases. Last, it is clearly time to reframe the narrative around diabetes, to acknowledge the similarities and differences between type one and type two, and avoid negative mes messaging around type two, for example. This is crucial to reframing the global rhetoric and advocacy towards positive messages that combat misinformation, stigma, and shame. The insights and themes arising from the informal consultation have been instrumental in shaping the format and content of today's global segment. But let's hear this firsthand. I would like to now pass the mic to the two co-chairs, two of the co-chairs from that consultation to share their insights. Serene and Heather, a pleasure to pass the mic to you. Thank you so much, Guy, and what a great honor to be here among so many amazing people creating meaningful impact. Um, if I may reflect back on the co-chairing experience, I must say that I am beyond honored to have taken part of the consultations. And I can't, cannot begin to explain how powerful they were and how beautiful it was to see so many people around the world come together, voice their concerns, collaborate around creating solutions. 
Um, a lot of input was shared at the consultations, but perhaps some main takeaways were as follows. People living with all shapes and colors of diabetes, along with caregivers, want to come together and collaborate and create a meaningful impact and change main major concepts around diabetes care and what people living with diabetes require for a healthy life. People living with diabetes around the world need access to primary health care, but they also need access to education and to psychosocial support. Access to insulin needs to come along with a global price tag, so no diabetic is left to ration his or her needs and unable to afford his or her insulin. And the price of lack of access, lack of education, and lack of affordability is unfortunate, unfortunately loss of human life. We chose to honor all the ones that have been lost, and we will come together and create a joint solution that will change the lives of generations to come. So no life is lost because of lack. And on a final note, when we choose to look at the COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of voices at the consultation wanted to see it as an example to how much can be done in a year once communities come together to prevent the pandemic. So creating solutions can be done once we take the needs of millions around the world with the same urgency as we did with the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, by stating that, I would like to give the floor to my co-chair, um, Heather, and thank you so much for allowing me the space to be a part of this very meaningful event. Heather? A pleasure for you to take the mic. You may be having uh, connection issues. Thank you. Yes, Heather. We are not knowledge. There we go. Maybe that's a bit better. We weren't we weren't uh, receiving your audio very well, Heather. You may be re rejoining. We'll wait a few seconds for you to rejoin. Hopefully that's possible. If not, we will continue with um, with the schedule. As soon as you can rejoin, Heather, happy to give you the floor. So um, great insights so far, and hopefully we can have Heather come back. Um, but uh, the Global Diabetes Compact really is celebrating a new vision for collaborative action and co-creation of solutions. Essential to this is revitalizing inclusive and positive global narrative, as, a, as we've just heard, that eradicates stigma and supports the prevention, management, and care of people living with diabetes. But this is also instrumental in building WHO's broader work around meaningful engagement of people living with NCDs. And in line with that, it is my extreme pleasure to share with you a report launched just today from the WHO informal consultation of people living with NCDs, which was held in December of 2020, entitled Nothing For Us Without Us. On the slide, you'll see the URL uh, but hopefully you will also find that easily on the YouTube, um, on the YouTube description. Uh, I, I would like to pick up a few messages from that report, which I hope you have time to read through and, and, and unpackage. Extremely rich in insights and perspective, but I'd like to pick up a few lessons learned, which are very complementary to the discussion we are having uh, with the community of people living with diabetes. And that is, first of all, meaningful engagement will activate agents of change to support more inclusive NCD principles, policies, programs, and services that are then adaptable to national, subnational, and community contexts. Second, people living with NCDs are experts. It's time to walk the top 
by including people living with NCDs along the full life cycle of intervention design, development, implementation, and governance. Third, there's a clear call from the community to develop a framework that can guide ethical and meaningful engagement of people living with NCDs, and that can support WHO and its member states move away from tokenism into full participation. Also, there's a need and a call for more comprehensive landscape analysis and further research to generate additional data on opportunities, challenges, best practices, and gaps that could be used as evidence to guide next steps to operationalize the co-creation of those effective, inclusive, and equitable responses to NCDs, mental health conditions, and the risk factors and determinants. And last, we've heard this and we repeat it is a very important intersectional differences such as comorbidities within and beyond NCDs, culture, race, and gender that can lead to the multi-layered lived experience were highlighted as an important strength of the value of engaging lived experience in designing those inclusive NCD policies and ensuring that they cater to that diversity and leave no one behind. Ultimately, by leveraging its role in global public health, WHO is ready to walk the talk with you and will support member states in doing the same. This is an opportune moment, both within the launch of the Global Diabetes Compact and in our collective efforts to build back better to ensure people living with NCDs are central to the response. Events like today and, the last, and that of last month are crucial to mapping this path forward inviting other individuals with lived experience to join and co-create the solutions going forward, including what we've mentioned on the WHO framework for meaningful engagement and the very important flagship Global Diabetes Compact. So I may come back to see if Heather is, is joined us again, um, is able to join and present her perspectives. Heather? I, we will invite you, if you can join later, to come into a, to another session, Heather. But for now, I'll give the floor back to, um, to our co-chairs. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Pons and Sureen. And um, Heather, we look forward to hearing from you when you're back. Uh, that was a wonderful recap of the time spent together at the informal consultation on people living with diabetes that spanned over three days last month and it brought together over 100 diabetes advocates from across the globe. Let's move on now to the engagement opportunities, which are divided into four panel discussions, governance, collaboration and partnerships, country implementation, and advocacy and education. We will introduce each panel one by one. The first panel that's um, coming up is the panel on governance led by David Chipanta from UNAIDS. Over to you, David. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, WHO Director General Tara Nupu, Sevetlan, Guy Serin, uh, for your excellent uh, remarks. That really sets um, up uh, very nicely uh, our panel, which is about operationalizing the meaningful engagement. Uh, of uh, people living with uh, diabetes. In uh, January 2021 this year, a family friend um, asked me to carry for him his insulin uh, from Geneva to Zambia. Uh, this reminded me of uh, friends who smuggled HIV drugs from Europe and the US to Zambia uh, for many of us living with, with HIV during the early days of the HIV epidemic. 100 years since uh, insulin was discovered, I cannot imagine, as the previous speakers have said, that insulin and associated devices are not available, at least not at a universally affordable price. In the AIDS movement, and uh, this is uh, what I know from uh, living with HIV for the past 30 years, we have actively engaged the different governance mechanisms to bring down the prices of ARVs and ensure that uh, HIV treatment is available to everyone. Now, and you will all agree with me, uh, HIV treatment is available to everyone, although pockets of inequality exist, 
and some people are left out. Diabetes uh, is different from HIV, but similar in many ways. In this session, we will unpack the how and why people living with, a, with diabetes should be meaningfully engaged in the governance structures of the Global Diabetes Compact, starting from WHO, from the global to the region, to the uh, countries and to the local. It is my great honor to introduce our esteemed panelists, Mr. Alex uh, Silverstein, who works, from, who works with the National Health Service in the UK. Welcome, welcome, Alex. Mr. Bruno Hellman from the International Diabetes Federation in Brazil. Welcome. Ms. Silvana Lucian from, the Pan from PAHO, Pan American Health Organization. Welcome. Last but not the least, Mr. Lyda Daniels, Chair of the National Indigenous Diabetes Association in Canada. Welcome. My first question to all of you and um, I'll ask you to be really uh, brief, maybe speak for about two minutes uh, to three minutes. Uh, my first question is, how can people living with diabetes be included in the governance of the Global Diabetes Compact at local, national, global levels? I'll start with, um, uh, with you, Alex. Uh, please uh, feel free to draw from your professional and, pers and, and, and personal experience of, uh, of uh, living and working uh, in the field of uh, diabetes. Alex, please uh, go ahead. Thank you very much, David. Um, so for me, I work for the National Health Service in the UK, and uh, we work as part of a project transforming diabetes care for 300,000 people across Northwest London. And we first put into legislation the need to engage people living with NCDs and living with diabetes in decisions about their care. Um, but that meant that we still had to work out how to do that. Um, and one of the things I created was this group called the Partners in Diabetes, which shortens to PID. Uh, so PID is also, for those who know project management, is what you create like a business case before you do any piece of work. And we did that on purpose because we we wanted everyone who worked for the NHS to, to understand that you speak to people uh, with diabetes before you start a project to see where you can co-create and you can co-engage co together. Um, and that's really worked well and enshrined in our group who self-organize themselves. Um, and they have monthly meetings via MS Teams or Zoom, and they invite us along as, as doctors or, or clinicians and we come up with plans together. Th thank you very much. Um, uh, Alex, we'll go to uh, Mr. Bruno Hellman. Thank you very much, David. Uh, so I was invited to, to share some of the best practice of how oper operationalizing the, the engagement of people living with but unfortunately, I can't share because there are not many to be shared. So what I want to focus uh, really briefly is that we are here to celebrate the lives that insulin made possible, but we can't forget those who were lucky and privileged enough to be here today. Uh, last year, WHO gave a really important step toward promoting a meaningful engagement and meaningful involvement of people living with. We must acknowledge the hard work that the GCM and the NCD department put into it. And then that was followed later this month with the informal consultation of people living with diabetes. WHO have set the example and gave a really important step towards meaningful engagement of people living with diabetes. But now it's time to member states to put words into practice. We are impatient of waiting. And as Alex said, we must create mechanisms to guarantee from scratch, from conceptualizing till monitoring and evaluating mechanisms, sustainable mechanisms to meaningfully involve and engage people living with 
diabetes, and other NCDs. We can't wait another 100 years to have insulin for all and comprehensive care. If not now, when? Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Bruno. Uh, we'll go to uh, Silvana. Thank you. Thank you, David. And I just want to start off by thanking Bruno and Tiara and Nupur and Serene and all of those who are with us today who are living with diabetes and lending their insights and perspectives. And also to congratulate my colleagues at WHO who are leading by example by including so many people living with diabetes in the Global Diabetes Compact. And I think we can all agree that this is a really important um, <clears throat> moment for the simple fact that people living with diabetes are the true experts on what is needed to manage their disease and prevent complications and how to improve the quality of care. Um, we know that this is a disease where there's a tremendous amount of self-care and family and community support that's needed. We also know that the way that the health services are organized and delivered and the health policies that are in place in communities that promote health all have an impact on patient outcomes. And it's only through the lived experiences of those that are living with diabetes and experiencing those challenges that we can better appreciate and fully understand um, their health needs and the challenges and how to overcome them. So who better to advise and be part of a governance of a diabetes initiative than those living with diabetes. And the whole purpose of governance of a diabetes initiative is to ensure that people's needs are met and that the initiative is sustainable and accountability is held throughout the process. So it begs the question, how do we ensure that? And I would say that first, as public health leaders, we must fully acknowledge and recognize and respect and value that inclusion and engagement with people living with diabetes and their caregivers, that they are a relevant part of governance and not only as informants, but as those true change agents and change makers as we've seen already through the informal consultation last month and really harnessing that energy to overcome those big challenges that we know exist to improve care. Um, secondly, we need to formalize that inclusion at the decision-making table right from the start with equal representation on the same level as input of professional experts and health authorities. Here at the Pan American Health Organization, we work really closely with governments throughout Latin America and the Caribbean. We co-design programs with our health authorities, and we have started to incorporate and consider the consultation and, and involve the community and people living with, with um, people living with diabetes. But I would say we're still at the early phases of having that as a principle and a, and a standard operating procedure. And I know that having this Global Diabetes Compact and the consultations that WHO globally is leading will help us change the way we're working um, and ensuring that the consultation with the community doesn't stop just in that program design phase, but that it's really meaningful throughout the process with evaluation and monitoring. Um, the other important thing I want to emphasize is, is having that stakeholder mapping that Guy just talked about to identify that range and that diversity of people living with diabetes so that we can ensure the gender balance, youth participation, um, diversity and ethnicity. And lastly, I also want to point out the need of providing the guidance and training and support for people living with diabetes for their active participation. We know that there are certain people who are more activist oriented and who are much more eager to participate and extroverted in that sense. But it's equally important to provide the training and support for those who may not be natural activists, but who have a very important role and passion to, um, to convey and be part of that governance process for a diabetes initiative. Back to you, David. Thank you, thank you so much, um, uh, Silvana. I uh, will go to the last but not the least, uh, Laya uh, Daniels. Mr. Laya Daniels, please, uh, you have the floor. Good day, everyone. It's a big honor for me to be a part of this uh, exciting opportunity. Um, I'm the, the chair for the National Indigenous Diabetes Association. I come for, uh, uh, to you today from Treaty 4 territory, the, the home of the, uh, the, the Cree, the Soto, the Dakota, Lakota, Lakota, and the Assiniboine people of, uh, of, of the mid part of, of, of Canada. Um, I represent the National Indigenous Diabetes Association made up of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people um, from all across Canada. Our board members are, uh, are part of a nonprofit organization. Um, one of the things that, uh, that sort of strikes me um, late in the game is being asked 
you know, a, a few weeks ago to be a part of this. Uh, being a person that has lived with uh, type 2 diabetes, I had a simple plan of eating less, eating healthy, and being active, losing 60 pounds, um, gaining my, my health back, um, getting off insulin because I'm able to um, fight it in, in, in a way that's, that's really um, uh, important for anybody that uh, is pre-diabetic, start planning, helping to, 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 to make them plan um, um, to, to not be a diabetic. And that's the whole goal of, uh, of NIDA in the sense that uh, we look at, at all aspects of, uh, of, of helping um, our community members. But what strikes me um, about this compact is that we need to sort of take, take it by the horns and realize, especially with, with the indigenous people in not only um, North America, but uh, Latin America and, and overall um, the Americas, with, with specifically the, the indigenous community, we were always left out and we're the most suffering of, of, of all um, in all of Canada. And specifically uh, within our First Nations communities, we're seen as third world uh, condition uh, living um, members. And uh, it shouldn't be like that. We need to work together to look at um, all the Indigenous communities, not only in, uh, in Canada. I always like to uh, brag about the fact that we've been here for thousands and thousands of years. We never had this problem of diabetes, and it's mainly because of our lifestyle, our nomadic lifestyle that we that we live for 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 that for that many generations. Where it came was through contact, and uh, and so we need to help our young people and help our people in the communities um, look at this disease, understand the disease, make education available for that, and um, and I think NIDA is uh, is the group to to be part of the governance to ensure that uh, this uh, group of people who are always last to be looked at um, is able to come to the forefront and uh, and be addressed and um, and also um, that we help that we need to help um, those people that are, are are horribly dying from all the effects of type two diabetes, but more importantly, help the ones that are pre diabetic and uh, and that. That, that we have a stake in making sure that that happens globally. And uh, we just want to be, we just want to have a foot in the door. And if we can do that collectively, we can learn together and, uh, and, 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 and help together, which is our goal at night. Thanks. Th th thank you so much, Alaya. Um, for, for me, this is a uh, uh, deja vu, is really leaving the HIV epidemic um, uh, uh, all over. It's about uh, exclusion. Uh, indigenous people have been excluded uh, in many things, and we see the results of that. In HIV, they are a big populations that are affected. It's about making the governance structures uh, work for, for all of us. And I think it's a little bit different here because WHO is taking the forefront, is in the leadership. And now I think I hear you, Bruno, Alex, Sylvana, that now what can countries do forward? And for me, I'm really extremely touched that you are saying we can't wait 100 years again for, 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 for people to stop um, uh, dying when we have insulin and the relevant um, uh, uh, assistive uh, devices are in place. Uh, I'll come back uh, 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 to each one of you now for any last uh, uh, minute uh, 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 intervention in less than one uh, in less than one, one minute, we will start with you, Alex. Uh, uh, what is the key thing uh, you would like uh, people listening uh, to this session to take away? Alex. Um, I, I think uh, the key thing for me would be to start small and focus on what you feel uh, people living with diabetes can make a meaningful impact on. And, and the way to find that out is just simply by asking them. Um, and if you bring them into the conversation um, and get them as close as to where the decisions are made, uh, the better the outcomes you will find for not just your health systems, but for the very people in your local communities. Um, so let's help create more partners in diabetes um, because, you know, we don't have enough clinicians in the world to, to manage diabetes. People need to step up if we're, if we're going to really uh, fight the rise of NCDs, 
we need to be working as partners. We need to be fighting this as partners and move from, you know, you said we did to we said and we did. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Alex. Um, uh, Silvana. Sure, thanks, David. So, you know, just talking and reflecting a little bit about the experience we had here at the Pan American Health Organization and two initiatives where we made an effort to um, involve people living with diabetes. One was in developing a patient-led education program called the Passport for Healthy Living. Um, and then the other was an advocacy campaign where we um, created a platform for people to, to have their asks to governments on, on what would be needed to improve quality of care for for diabetes. Um, and some of the barriers that we encountered through this experience was really not knowing how to find those right advocates and champions and having that right level of representation. Um, you know, some countries do have organized civil society and NGO representation, and Bruno is here as, as a testament for that in one of the countries in our region, um, but other countries don't have that level of organization. So I think one of the things to address is how can we create those forums, those networks, and, and create that um, civil society opportunity um, and, and communication and relationship. And then the other thing I think would be around communication because we felt that there was some moments where there's distrust, right? Because there isn't that previous experience of, um, of meaningful contribution and, and, and engagement and co-creating initiatives together. So it does take time to build the trust and confidence and have the right language and the common inclusive communication. It's trial and error and, um, and we keep you know, working at it to get it right. But, um, but I think this Global Diabetes Compact will really create the platform for rolling out in our region to have more inclusive, consistent participation for people living with diabetes. Over. Thank, thank you very much, um, uh, Silvana. Uh, Bruno, please uh, go ahead. Thank you very much, David. Uh, so I'd like to, to make two points. The first one, it's impressive how the global health community managed to, to get together and to cooperate to fight COVID-19. And that took just a couple of months. Why the global health community has been taking so long to get together and fight the diabetes pandemic that have been affecting us for many years. Last but for, but for not least, I'd like to, uh, to reinforce again that me and many others who are here today and who are capable and able to access insulin and comprehensive care are lucky and privileged and that we must assure that every person that lives with diabetes receives the right and the caring support to live with this chronic condition that unfortunately is still really deadly. It can be controlled, it can be uh, we can live a fully and happy life uh, with diabetes, but for that we need to, the commitment we need that the, the member states to assure that they will join the conversation and work side to side with us because the community of people living with diabetes are, read, are more than ready to, to join the conversation and more than ready to, to put our hands on, on, on public policies to, assure uh, meaningful engagement of people living with to assure that the global targets on NCDs will match, but we need the room and we need the space. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Bruno. Uh, Mr. Lyo Daniels, uh, uh, least but not the least, you have uh, the last but not the least, you have the floor, please. Well, I would like to make uh, just a couple of comments. One, um, we need to better the, the community education whenever we're able to. You know, some of the things that I realize um, looking at First Nations and some of the isolated communities in, in Canada is connectivity to the internet and uh, all, of, all of that that prohibits the opportunity for us to, to get information down to the community. We have some great community health workers uh, right across the country, but they need more tools to be able to uh, um, um, do their job properly. And one of them is we always, we always work at, at, at developing a, a, a particular 
diabetes program in, in one of the halls in one of our communities. But some people can't even come to the, to the community hall. We need to make it so that people are able to, 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 to sit in their own homes and be able to uh, listen to people and, and give uh, the people that are in our communities that are right now restricted to their homes right now because of COVID, uh, the ability to, to, to hear uh, role models and, and hear people who have uh, done well for themselves um, uh, in fighting this horrible disease. Now, saying that, um, when it comes to this, uh, this, 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 this diabetes compact that we're looking at developing, it's important that we have proper representation, uh, um, including people that live with diabetes like myself, um, and I'm not saying that might be me from, from, from our organization. I, have a, I work, work so closely with awesome colleagues with the, the National Indigenous Diabetes Association. But my co-chair, Robin, looks after the, the, the preventative side and, 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 and the traditional medicine side of, of, of what we need to do on the, on the diabetes side. And, and looking at that as an opportunity to, 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 to heal our people. And, uh, and we've used plants and medicines uh, as medicine for, for, for generations and thousands and thousands of years. We need to get back to some of those basics to ensure that uh, uh, we look at every means to help um, all of our people um, across Turtle Island or North America. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel. Uh, excellent. I'm really uh, excited. You know, excellent um, uh, information, strong uh, energy. And, and I think, um, as uh, Alex said, uh, if we want to work with, peop with people with diabetes, uh, if we want the best intervention, let's ask them. We, we, we have heard what people are saying. Let's ask them, but also let's listen to them. Uh, with that, um, I thank you all the panelists and uh, over to you, Nepo and uh, Tara. Thank you so much, David and our panelists. Um, that was such a great discussion. Um, I am very happy to hear more about like diversity and, uh, and inclusivity, especially amongst um, First Nation individuals uh, with diabetes. So we're gonna roll into our next panel. Uh, and this is gonna be about collaboration and partnerships and addressing barriers uh, to access. And the moderator for this discussion will be Michelle Farmer from NCD Child here in the US. Michelle, over to you. Great, thank you so much, Tiara. Uh, and thanks also to Nupur, um, your co-host for this, uh, this wonderful summit. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing the panel uh, of uh, contributors for collaborations and partnerships. This is a panel of highly skilled, well-informed people. And I'll give brief introductions for each one. We'll start with Emma Doble, who has been working with the British Medical Journal since 2018 as their patient editor for education. We have Bridget McNulty, who is the co-founder of Sweet Life Diabetes Community and the co-founder for South African Diabetes Advocacy and Diabetes Alliance. She's been living with type one diabetes for 14 years and is a member of the International Diabetes Federation Blue Circle Voices. We have Dr. Slim Slama, who is a regional technical advisor for the World Health Organization in the Eastern Mediterranean region. And Dr. Slama provides technical assistance for uh, non-communicable diseases and management uh, in the 22 member states of the Eastern Mediterranean region. Uh, and this region uh, affords him the opportunity also to work with uh, several areas uh, that are facing humanitarian crises to strengthen the provision of healthcare for people living with uh, chronic diseases, including diabetes. And finally, we have Dr. Catherine Duggan, who is the Chief Executive Officer for the International Pharmaceutical Federation. And from her uh, position, she is responsible for visionary leadership, support, development, and advocacy across 144 member organizations and over 4 million members of the FIP. So welcome to all of the members of my panel. I'm gonna start with, uh, one question that I will ask each of uh, uh, my panelists to uh, respond to, and that is, 
how can collaborations and partnerships help people living with diabetes to meaningfully engage with the compact, with the global diabetes compact? So I'll start with Emma. Thanks, Michelle. I think this is a, a really important question. And, and for me, I really think back to what does partnership really mean? And to me, it really means trust, it means openness, and it means transparency. And in order to have you know, a good partnership, we need all three of those traits in there. And for me, that is how we address that some of the barriers is in using those three traits. So the first thing I think I would really ask for is that all of the, the people with living with diabetes have a seat at the table in all of our organizations and all of the work that we do, um, whether that's with the compact, but also within our own local communities. I hope that all of the, the countries and, and organizations involved really open their doors to people living with diabetes and ask them to take a seat at the table and to really involve them in all aspects of the work in implementing this compact. I think the second thing is to really know and understand what the barriers are for people living with diabetes to really meaningfully engage with this work. And I think in order to do that, the, the most simple way really is to ask the people living with diabetes what the barriers are for them to get involved and to really implement this in, in their own communities. I think the third thing would be to really provide support and to ensure that partnership with people living with diabetes is prioritized by all of those involved in the compact and that can be from everything in supporting people living with diabetes to go into their communities to work with their own communities um, and also to provide resources tools and, and also the financial support for um, people living with diabetes to do so thank you great thank you so much emma bridget over to you Thanks, Michelle. For me, the most uh, important part of this question is the meaningful engagement part. So as people living with diabetes, we know that we're often called on to share our stories of what it's like to have diabetes and how it affects our experiences. But we're all also professionals in our own right. So diabetes isn't our only identifier, it's just one part of us. We could be digital strategists or doctors or accountants or lawyers. And I think if we can meaningfully engage both as people with diabetes and people who are professionals, that could go a long way. And then the other thing I, I really see an opportunity for here is breaking down the silos of good work that we've all been doing. So in my work with the South African Diabetes Alliance, we brought together all the diabetes organizations, associations and companies in South Africa to sit around the table with the National Department of Health and share what work we're doing. And what we discovered is that everyone has great intentions and everyone's doing great jobs, but we're doing them in silos. And if we can all come together as a global community for diabetes and share the work that we're doing, we can break down those silos. As Emma said, we can, we can work together with transparency and we can start building a future for diabetes together. But the, the missing ingredient for that is obviously funding because otherwise, we all have great ideas, but they stay as ideas. And if we can move beyond that with funding, I think we can have a really powerful impact. Great, thank you so much, Bridget. A lot of, a lot of great ideas that you've shared with us. Uh, next, we'll go over to Slim. Uh, Slim, uh, what are your thoughts on this question about partnerships as a vehicle for meaningful engagement for people living with diabetes? Thank you, Michelle, and uh, very happy to be among you uh, tonight. Uh, just wanted to grant also all the colleagues from this part of the world that are on the second day of Ramadan, Ramadan Karim to all of you. And I'm really delighted, including for people uh, living with diabetes that uh, are fasting uh, in this part of the world. Um, I think the, the, the partnership aspect from a, a WHO point of view have already a bit highlighted by uh, Guy in the previous um, introductory remarks and the last panel. I think uh, uh, I really invite you again to uh, get access to that um, uh, report of the informal consultation that for me, I think we have set some of the element of the agreement around meaningful engagement. And I come from a region I have been here, I mean, uh, more than seven years and a half now in this uh, region where half of the countries have uh, in conflict, uh, political instability. So meaningful engagement uh, is beyond, I think, uh, patient voices. I think it's really about human rights and accountability and claiming the rights. And sometimes it's very difficult in an environment that politically or even from a cultural pers perspective, 
do not ask people about expressing their needs and voicing those needs. So I think uh, we have a unique opportunity through the compact and other platform pro from programmatic areas on NCD to create, I think, uh, a space. And I think uh, some of the ingredients have already been listed by previous uh, speakers in the first and, and this panel. One is really to reorient the power uh, towards agent of change. And this actually starts, and I was really pleased to see in all um, the intervention recently, a change in the narrative from patient, from very care oriented to lived experiences. What a fabulous wording, I think, to start with. I think changing the narrative start by having a consensus on how we phrase things and how we frame them. I think lived experiences is for me a very nice way to start, is to change this, bringing also the consensus on how uh, we discuss uh, the issue. The second aspect is diversity and inclusiveness. And as I mentioned, um, we are, for instance, in the Emerald region, uh, one of the regions with uh, most of the forcibly displaced population, refugee. How you include all those marginalized population? And we have example through, um, for instance, the NCD Alliance chapter in the region have had a, a regional consultation that was really even looking at uh, inclusiveness, uh, even reaching out to like refugee and Syrian refugee in different I mean, countries in the region and trying to keep a pulse on what is happening, what are their needs, how do they, I think, uh, voice their, their needs and how can we support them? The second aspect I think that is really critical and some of the colleagues have already mentioned it, is creating uh, an engagement framework, which is really critical for WHO in particular because all type of informal or formal consultation with WHO have to be somehow formalized. I think creating that engagement framework as uh, Guy and the colleague from the Global Coordination Mechanism had mentioned, I think is, 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 is the key uh, element. And, and for that, actually, uh, we need also to create, like we have done recently, and I really like the informal consultation because uh, to give power, we need also to create a protective environment where voices can be shared and experiences can be shared in a protective environment. And specifically for people that have not been used to do that, whether because of the political context or because of the health literacy or an ability to express their voices, I think we need to build that capacity, so like some colleagues. So created the space and building capacity for me would be the other, uh, the other element. And the last point is engaging for a purpose. In other words, um, there is a need really to have specific ask about what we want to change and how are we going to do about it? What are the targets and being able to track progress over time? We usually do that with our member states because we are a member state driven organization. We are, we are there to serve actually population and people. So I think that voice from uh, people that are agent of change uh, to us specific project and to give you two example now, I mean, one that is very timely because we're entering Ramadan in the region, we are starting to work with some organization like DA and the International Diabetes Federation on diabetes during Ramadan. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, many of people living with diabetes are fasting. How can we provide guidance for safe fasting? What are the practices of people around the globe that are in Muslim countries and practicing um, the, the fast and Ramadan? How can we help them? I think it's starting by just experiencing, uh, by um, uh, uh, supporting people living with diabetes, expressing their needs, but also their expenses in diabetes. So I think these are some of the ingredients that I foresee as being important uh, in, in collaboration and partnership is uh, creating uh, an environment, engaging, but also having a, a clear focus in terms of intervention and program that we would like to, uh, to work on. Over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Slim. Uh, Catherine, what are your perspectives on partnerships for meaningful engagement of people living with diabetes? Thank you so much, Michelle. I must just say, first and foremost, it's such an honour to be part of this panel and to have listened to the previous one as well. Thank you so much uh, to Emma, Bridget and Slim for your insights and thank you, Michelle, for your, your questions. So. I think it's worth us just going back to the partnership thing. And I think the whole of the, the past year, if we were gonna use it for any good, because of the harms that it's caused to our um, communities and societies, I think it would be that we need to work together. And that for me, as a chief executive of a not-for-profit organization that has a vision that everyone should benefit from access to safe and affordable medicines in pharmacy, 
what a salutary tale tonight has given us because seriously we need to get that we need to get that right not only in vaccines during covid but also look it's 100 years since insulin has been developed so let's get that let's get the access to in insulin a bit better um by the way may i just say um <laughs> a huge uh, ramadan Purin to everyone and also slim i've just been reflecting on your thoughts and how all of our pharmacists out there based in all our communities could possibly help with the message of how we may uh, support people who are in with living with diabetes but maybe having to fast because of different uh, beliefs and uh, customs and festivities um that that doesn't uh, preclude ourselves from thinking about just uh, muslim societies only but everyone everyone has times where they may need it so i promise you we will work in collaboration to think about how pharmacy can help you with that and actually michelle really all of this is about organizations like my own thinking about how we can support the patients and the public that we're listening to tonight to achieve that better endeavor so I will keep on feeding in as we go through the discussion here tonight, but I promise you, we will take some key messages home for FIP as a federation. Thank you so much, Catherine. You know, I'd like to uh, ask one follow-up question to just briefly for, um, for the time the remaining for our, our, our wonderful panel. Um, what would be your strongest recommendation going forward? so that we can have stronger partnerships uh, supporting the Global Diabetes Compact. You know, we can't overlook where we are today, not only uh, in the standpoint that Catherine has brought up that, you know, in uh, 100 years ago, we've uh, discovered insulin, but we're still struggling with access to medicines e equally around the world. But we're also struggling with uh, a global pandemic of COVID-19, there are many humanitarian crises uh, due to uh, strife or due to natural disasters. You know, so that we have to develop and strengthen our partnerships in the context of where we are today. So I'm gonna start with uh, Emma. Um, what's your strongest recommendation for where we need to go so we can make sure that the Global Diabetes Compact has a, the best impact that it can possibly have? I think that from my side, that the most important thing is to have people living with diabetes at the seat of a table for every element of what we do in diabetes care. And that goes through all our different governments, organisations, anything that we have that is about people living with diabetes, there should be a seat at that table for somebody living with diabetes to be involved and actively involved in all elements of the planning, delivery and implementation of that. Thank you so much, Emma. Bridget, what about you? So I love this question because it feels like there's so much opportunity when we look forward to the next 100 years of where we could end up. Um, even if you look at where we are this evening, we are so, all so easily globally connected. We're from every corner of the world and yet we're all able to speak to each other about a topic that we're so passionate about. That is very exciting to me. And I think when we look at what COVID-19 has done, particularly in South Africa, in my experience, it really shone a spotlight on diabetes because diabetes is one of the top comorbidities. And there's an opportunity there because people have realized that diabetes is urgent and that we can't wait and we need to start taking action with diabetes now. And I think it's also given us a lingo that we all understand now, this lingo of flattening the curve. So when I look at diabetes in South Africa, it's the number one killer of women in South Africa, which is outrageous because it's not a lethal condition, as we all know. But we have this opportunity. We're definitely on the upward trajectory of the curve. Things are getting worse and worse. And if we can intervene now, if we can intervene with diabetes education and with access to the right medication and with this global diabetes compact and make a real difference, we can flatten the curve of diabetes. It doesn't have to get to the top of that curve and we don't have to have all these people dying of a condition that no one should ever die of. And so I would say if we look forward to the next 100 years, if we can have flattened the curve of diabetes, we will have done something remarkable and necessary. And if I look specifically at what the Global Diabetes Compact offers, 
there are these eight action areas and each of them are so beautiful and, and the vision and the concept for each of them are so beautiful. And I really want to make sure that we are all aware of the fact that beauty is not enough. We have to get super practical and like I would say probably down to getting a working group around each of those eight areas where we take one step on the journey to seeing that vision come to life. But we have to start with a really practical first step. And of course, there has to be funding attached to that, the magical funding. Great. That's a great suggestion, Bridget. You're, you're right. We we must uh, have sufficient funding for meaningful uh, next steps. Um, now, uh, briefly, Slim, um, and then Catherine, what are your recommendations? I think uh, I agree with just what uh, Bridget mentioned. Uh, we have seen also with the COVID pandemic in, in this region uh, uh, that have really added to the burden of pre-existing, I mean, conflict, instability, weak health system, fragile state. So all this, there is an opportunity to build better, but uh, to build better with much more inclusion. I think uh, we have in the region different initiative also on health as a bridge for peace or other elements to reinforce health system. We have seen many countries that are uh, on the journey of universal health coverage trying to reform massively. I was in Pakistan recently where a new uh, essential benefit package is being rolled out progressively. So there are different entry points um, for the country to build back better. But I think on the aspect of meaningful engagement, um, I really would like to look from a regional perspective on how we would, for instance, operationalize the recommendation of the report that just been released on um, nothing on us without us. What does it mean uh, for our region to take one step uh, ahead and say so one by one and say, what does it mean in practice? What does it mean in terms of uh, meaningful engagement, inclusiveness, stakeholder mapping, framework, all those elements that actually are being highlighted in the report. I will invite all the colleagues to look at them and reflect from a regional perspective, from their own country perspective, what can I do to advance and, and contribute to this global effort? This is how I would see, I mean, may, the way forward for me in terms of recommendation. Just take it from this informal consultation, from the voice of people around the world that have told us, I mean, very interesting uh, suggestions have been made. I think we need to personalize them. And this is our accountability of WHO, that this is not just one informal consultation, but just uh, the first step on a, on a long journey together. Over to you. Thank you so much, Slim. And Catherine? I think, Michelle, um, so much has been said by my previous colleagues, but I have to say, you know, you can produce reports that have great intents, and, and then it's down to all of us to implement them, Michelle. It's not down to WHO. WHO have done the consultation and have thought through all of those eight action areas. And for my federation, if we have a vision for a world where everyone benefits from access to safe and affordable medicines, what are we gonna do to make sure that actually happens, Michelle? We have to take some accountability for that. And I have to say, you know, um, uh, the COVID pandemic has given us much pause for thought and it's caused a lot of trauma in so many of our countries. But one of the big things is that if you don't have a healthy population, they can't work and they cannot contribute to the um, success of that country. So our governments need to listen to this really loud and clear. And for a hundred years, we've had insulin available to us We've had other therapeutic advances av available to us and who knows what's down the track. And if we don't allow equitable access to those medicines through all ports of call, and I will, I will describe to you, Michelle, all the ways that pharmacy can help you. My goodness me, if we don't all stand up shoulder to shoulder on this endeavor, I think we'll miss a chance. And um, of course, communicable, communicable diseases like COVID cause us a great big um, acute crisis, but we have all the NCDs and diabetes is our first and foremost pause for thought. So I will commit that pharmacy, not just community pharmacy who can help with prevention and um, uh, the way in which we can access our communities to help keep them healthier. And even when they are uh, being treated with um, diabetes, that they can be as healthy as possible. But all of our constituencies from drug development to drug delivery, drug manufacturer, all of those elements of pharmacy, we will stand shoulder to shoulder in this endeavor. I think it's time. I think the pandemic has opened our eyes to the fact that 
inequity and inequality in access is no longer tolerable because it doesn't keep our societies viable and the business um, the business elements of our governments will understand that. Thank you so much, Catherine. That was a very powerful recommendation. Uh, you know, I, and I want to thank my entire panel. I, I learned a lot from your contributions here. You know, I'm hearing that, you know, we can't just say build back better. We must take action. We must start now to make the difference for the next 100 years, that we will work together collaboratively embracing the leadership of those with lived experiences for an inclusive process, inclusive partnerships that will be action oriented for which we will be accountable and that we will include people living with diabetes as informed and valued colleagues, not just a tokenism representation for storytelling, but really providing meaningful leadership and engagement side by side with businesses, with the World Health Organizations, with civil society. We will do this so that we will have a united and integrated approach through the Global Diabetes Compact. I wanna thank my panel. You've given me a lot to think about and I think that we all will uh, work together being prepared to take action going forward. So thanks very much. And I'll turn to all of my panelists and I will turn the floor back to our co-chairs, our co-hosts, Nupur and Tiara. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. I'm sure um, all our viewers who, are, who have been watching this will agree this was a very insightful panel discussion. Um, thank you, Michelle, for moderating it beautifully. And uh, thank you to our panelists, Emma, Bridget, Slim, and Catherine. Um, wonderful points there really really uh, a lots to chew on and lots to think about like michelle mentioned um also ramadan wishes to all our friends across the globe um our third panel next uh, coming up now is on country implementation and the moderator for this panel discussion is jill farrington from the regional office for europe of the world health organization over to you jill Thank you so much and thank you for the honour of being able to uh, join you this evening and to be part of this event and the panel. We've had some uh, great panels before us, but we also have a great set of speakers and with great experience to share with you. If I introduce the different uh, speakers that we have this evening, we have uh, Christelle Boyer, who is the project manager for the first type 1 diabetes registry in the, in the Caribbean, which is the Ian Woosnam type 1 diabetes registry. And she's also a, pa a patient advocate and spokesperson for diabetes and chronic non-communicable diseases. We have uh, Edith Mokantwara, who is from the African Diabetes Alliance based in Uganda. She's the co-founder of the Alliance. Uh, which is a patient support organization that empowers people uh, to disarm uh, diabetes daily in Africa. And she herself has experience uh, of type one diabetes for 16 years and is a nutritionist by profession and diabetes educator. We have my colleague from the Southeast Asian uh, office of WHO, uh, Dr. Gampo uh, Dorji. He's the technical officer for non-communicable diseases based in New Delhi uh, in India, and he is supporting 11 member states in NCD service delivery and the management of non-communicable diseases, including diabetes. And finally, we have uh, Professor Kaushik Ramaya, who is a consultant physician and the chief executive officer at the Sri Hindu Mandal Hospital in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. And amongst uh, uh, at several appointments, he's also the general secretary of the Tanzania Diabetes Association, the Tanzania NCD Alliance, and a member of the board of the World Diabetes Foundation. So we have a great set of panelists who have both professional and personal experience of diabetes, who are active within their communities, within their countries and internationally. And we look forward to the different perspectives and the experience that they're going to share with us. 
Our panel is focusing on country implementation, and that's both country implementation of diabetes programs, but how we are also implementing this engagement of people living with diabetes. How are we actually putting this into action, moving from dialogue to action? And um, the question that I'm going to ask to all panelists first is what are the challenges that they're finding in implementing at country level, both the programs, but also in terms of engagement? And I'm going to start first uh, with Crystal. So Crystal, could we have your comments on this question? Thank you. Hi, everyone. It is so great to be here. So let's draw a line in the sand. It could be beach sand, desert sand, or even snow. Now, stand right in the middle. Turn your head to one side. It is your perfect diabetes landscape, environment, and life. And on the other, it's not. When you turn your head to the left, access to quality healthcare is almost non-existent. And to the right, specialist visits, expert care, where pushing boundaries and clinical trials are the norm you see vast differences in education from those who don't understand the basics of diabetes or even what type they have to those who are carb counting and even looping on their own. You see families who are completely destroyed where finances decide what health decisions are priority and where burdens cause its structure to crumble to situations where families unite, pool resources and thrive. As you turn your head to the left, both those living with the disease and their family members lose their jobs as stigma and the burden of constant care takes over their lives in contrast to those who work in environments that fully support and understand them. You see those who are celebrated for their input at the policy level to those who are told they don't matter. You see situations where type one diabetes does not want to be grouped with type two diabetes and vice versa as the stigmas make it harder for them to be accepted to situations where all forms of diabetes celebrate and support each other. You want to cry when you see amputees, kidney disease, dialysis, premature death, but then you swivel and see those with diabetes living full lives, sometimes healthier than those without. You see those experimenting with new insulins, awesome technologies and free care to those who ration, store insulin below ground, test their sugar only a few times a week due to lack of supply and worry from dose to dose. You see privilege and inequity at the forefront from those who use and access the diabetes online community to its fullest and those who don't even know about it or this day that we are celebrating even exists. On my island, only 166 square miles long, along my line in the sand, there are many faces looking to the right in search for a better future. The challenges are diverse. The people are by the thousands. It's time to close the gap, blur the line, and build an equitable future for all. Thank you so much, Crystal. That was such a rich picture of the realities of living with diabetes for people and for their families and, and really uh, strong examples of the challenges they face. Can I turn now to Edith? Can we have your comments on that question? Um, hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity and thank you for everyone that's discussed before me. It's been quite an engaging discussion, really getting us to think. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges that um, we have in country implementation here is um, a lot of misinformation, which is a big problem because a lot of people have uh, so many myths and they truly believe these things. So uh, in addition to that, there's a lot of uh, fear connected to diabetes. A lot of people believe it is a death sentence, whether or not you try your best to manage it, they believe once you have it, you're gone. So there's a lot of fear associated with it. And because of that, people are not willing to go for testing. People are not willing to, you know, uh, to go to uh, healthcare centers, just, just the idea that they could have diabetes, just the, the fear is so great that they'd rather not know. And that's where the biggest challenge is because the lack of proper information is a big, big challenge. Um, another issue that a lot of patients do find is um, 
Number one, there's a very diverse difference in access, in care. Uh, be, amongst all the countries uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, there are so many differences so that um, the, the experiences are so different as well. And finding, um, definitely the patients do have a, a huge role that they play. Usually when patients come together, that is when um, they start to thrive. You know, when they find their community, they start to thrive. So um, trying to, and unfortunately the communities are few and they're not well supported either. So uh, trying to find and engage patients really, really well would be a big uh, help. Um, it's also, um, unfortunately, uh, there's very little, in, uh, sorry, uh, funding in, uh, in, in education and awareness creation and food and nutrition, for example. And these are big things that can actually help people prevent diabetes or prevent complications. And um, without that knowledge, a lot of people are going to struggle, you know, because without any lifestyle change, a lot of the time, uh, diabetes does not get managed well. So um, getting um, some uh, funding for some of these things would be really would go a long way to help people who are already low, like usually um, disadvantaged and, you know, looking for simple solutions. These are simple solutions that we could use to help a lot of people, um, you know, uh, keep away from the detriments of diabetes. Um, another thing I think uh, we really need is having a united front as people working in diabetes, uh, working together would be amazing because even the leadership um, being diverse, being visible, you know, the thing is a lot of the time people are struggling in villages or wherever they may be and they can't find people to go to for help, for support. So trying to find ways to be more, become more visible so the people that need help know when you go to this place, you can actually get assistance. Um, I think those are some of the things I would say would be uh, the challenges, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Edith. So you've given us a, a really good list. I mean, you've covered areas such as the misinformation, the fears, the myths, but also right over to issues like access to education, funding, and, and being united together. If, if I turn now to uh, Gampo, would you like to add from your perspective on this question? What are the challenges that you're seeing in the different countries in which you're working? Thank you, Jill, and uh, good uh, evening, everyone. It is good uh, late night here from New Delhi. It's such an interesting uh, discussion, and I would like to throw some light on some of the challenges in implementing diabetes program, uh, uh, primarily from maybe Southeast Asia regional perspective. We have heard this in the earlier discussions, and it came out multiple times that access equity to to uh, diabetes services is an issue and a big issue. And uh, in order to sort of uh, address this, uh, from my perspective, I feel that uh, uh, from population and public health perspective, attention to the primary health care approach uh, to integrate diabetes services as an integral part of the service is the key. And we already know that there are already existing uh, deficiencies there although the governments are taking very incremental steps into improving primary healthcare system, the current systems, especially in low and middle income countries, mostly are not geared toward providing people-centered uh, uh, diabetes services by which I mean, you know, there's no recall, reminder, follow-up mechanisms. And in the process, overall at the national level, the program um, accountability management are also weak and there's no uh, proper indicators to uh, measure the coverage of services and there are control rates for glycemic uh, control rates of the programs. So there are a lot of areas there, uh, the, the national programs and the, and the health service delivery systems are challenged with. So we must recognize that this, these are amenable and we must pay a very focused attention to improving this part of the, the health service delivery system to ensure that we improve access and equitable diabetes services. On, in, on the part of the engagement of the people living with uh, diabetes and people living with other NCD conditions, I checked with my friends in the country offices this afternoon just to assure myself. And what was common theme emerging from their voice was that the concept of engaging people with the conditions 
or with lived experience is very uh, new, fairly new in the Southeast Asia region at least. And we have a huge opportunity. There's a huge gap there, but with compact launch, I think uh, it gives us special uh, impetus to move forward. And I was, I'm already thinking some interesting steps uh, from here on. Thank you. Over to you, Jill. Thank you, Gampa. So you've uh, drawn attention to the access to services and the weak uh, health systems, but also recognizing that in some regions and some countries, engagement with people with uh, diabetes is actually um, a concept or a way of working that, that they may not be used to. Okay. Can I move to uh, Kaushik uh, from Tanzania and ask if you have any uh, thoughts or comments to add on this question? Dr. Kaushik Karamaya, I can see you're connected, but maybe you need yeah, to yeah, mute. Sorry. Yeah, right, sorry. Thank you. thank you very much, uh, Jill. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me to be part of this panel. Uh, responding to your question regarding uh, what are the challenges in implementation at the country level, uh, I would look at it from four, four points of view. Uh, I would start with uh, First of all, I would start with component of the health system and I would say the policy and the programmatic level. Second thing, I would look at from the health system approach of what can we deliver at the health system. And the third, I would look at the dimension of looking at people with the disease or how would they be able to access or actually uh, get the care which they require. So if you look at the policy and the programmatic level, I think most of the countries have been late in starting the national programs. They have started programs, but at very small levels initially, at initial levels, and most of these conditions have been managed at the tertiary care or a secondary care. Hardly any services have come down to the primary care. Second is that diabetes was never a priority initially in the developing world. And you would say that probably diabetes was a disease of the rich, but basically diabetes currently affects whether it's rich or poor, but it affects everyone. And the third is the dimension of children or people with the type one diabetes where they require insulin, which is life-saving. So if you look at resource allocation, the resource allocation for non-communicable disease was very low. And especially if you look into non-communicable disease, priority would be hypertension and diabetes would be bottom of the list. Again, how would the health system respond? So if you have a person with diabetes, if he goes to the primary care, there would be no diagnostic equipment, you would have no medication, you would have to go to a secondary care or a tertiary care. So again, transport, cost of going to the, to the service to seek a service would be a big challenge. Human resources for health, again, hardly any trained people at the primary care or the secondary care. At tertiary care, you would have the experts or you would have people who have been trained. So challenges of getting human resources for health or managing people with diabetes, or giving them a clinical care, giving them the comprehensive component would also be an issue. And finally, if you are able to tackle that, then supply chain would be an issue in a sense that are you actually able to take your products or are you able to take the commodities to the last mile? in a sense that are you able to supply insulin? Are you able to supply the strips? Are you able to supply the syringes to the last stage? In addition to that, there's a social dimension. Social dimension is the cost of going to the clinic, able to basically family, able to afford providing the services or provide, providing the commodities purchasing. And then finally, you have the challenge within the socioeconomic component within the family is that are you able to sustain because this is a lifelong medication. The lessons we have to learn from is, is from the HIV program. And if you see it from the HIV program, you find that one, you had an unique identity number for each of the patient who was registered. And if that patient was able to access clinic anywhere in the country, they would be able to get the medication. Unfortunately, we do not have a unique identity number or a unique identity uh, of an individual who has been diagnosed with diabetes or any of the non-communicable disease. So the same person might be seeking care at four different facilities and getting four different medications. So that is a challenge there that you have and you need to have 
a consistent program which is actually tracking these patients and what is happening to them. In addition to that, you have what we call as a comorbidities with diabetes and probably in patients who are attending the HIV clinics, patients who are attending the TB clinics, patients who are attending the hypertension clinic, whether we are making enough efforts to diagnose people with undetected diabetes. And currently, with the COVID-19, you can see that many of the patients who came to the hospital and the clinics were those who were undiagnosed with diabetes and came with very high levels of blood glucose, which probably they never knew that they had diabetes, and that caused about quite a significant comorbidities. And finally, the question about empowerment of the people with diabetes. Are we empowering adequately enough so they can fight for their rights? And if you see is that I believe that HIV world had activism in advocacy, while in diabetes world, I think we have been very docile. We have no activism, and that is why we have not been able to get our way around. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You've, you've covered a whole range of things. One of the things I take away is for what you were saying at the beginning about countries having been late with implementation and late in putting a, a priority on the work of diabetes and then organizing the systems uh, accordingly. Uh, in the time that we've got left, I'd just like to be able to go back to each of the uh, panel members and to see if they've got any further thoughts on what are some of the opportunities for overcoming the challenges that either they've mentioned or that they've heard um, other colleagues and, and panelists uh, mention. I mean, in the consultation previously, there were suggestions around um, uh, designing more inclusive programs, um, uh, co-designing and co-creating uh, some of the um, uh, different initiatives, but I wonder if there's anything that you would uh, like to add in terms of solutions. Let's start first with Crystal again. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jill. So as a patient myself who works in communities with persons with diabetes, I believe it's essential for the Global Diabetes Compact to partner with community-based organizations and local groups in small villages and towns to engage the grassroots community and build a movement for change. Yes, more and more systems have increasingly targeted diabetes by implementing various programs. However, little work has focused on what types of interventions are likely to succeed among the poorest people with limited resources. These groups have special challenges and research and programs designed in more advantageous populations cannot and should not be generalized here. We need to meet them where they are, even if it's within non-traditional spaces such as churches and barber shops or corner shops and village shops as we have here in Barbados and design programs that fit their unique needs considering their culture and language. Building these small resource limited community groups and organizations and training them so that they all meet the minimum requirement for diabetes management and care is essential. These small groups are where big change in tiny pockets around the world take place. Educating them empowers the people they serve and provides them with the tools they need to better understand how to live and thrive as best they can in their world and not ours. As everyone has said, people living with diabetes are an underutilized resource. Uh, we need to work with them on the ground to co-create programs. There is one way to look at something until someone with lived experience shows us how to look at it with new eyes. We need to tap into the eyes, ears, minds, hearts of those on the ground with lived experience. There is beauty there, there is power there, there is knowledge and creativity there. That is where the real change begins. Thank you. Well, wow, some great quotes uh, to take there. Let's start small, it can lead to big change and that's where the beauty and the power is, but also targeting uh, and tailoring uh, to the needs of the, uh, the poor and the disadvantaged. Can we move on to uh, Edith, would, would you like to add? Yes, please. Um, so I think, um, our in our communities um, in Africa, um, a lot has to be done to educate the masses because 
that's where the biggest challenge is. So that requires better communication, better education and empowerment because you can't educate people that, well, you can educate them, but rarely will that education manifest into actual impact if they're not empowered to use that education. So um, it's a whole overhaul of the system, um, enabling patients to actually uh, make the changes that they need to make. Um, another another uh, another one i think would be really having a a vibrant leadership would be um amazing uh, because like i said before um if patients are looking for solutions but they can't find them and the only option is to go to the medicine man or to go to the herbal the herbal doctor or to go to you know the the, the local the, the local i guess herbalist and those are the only options they have majority of people are getting um, issues health issues because of that uh, a lot of people are abandoning medication for those um, herbal concoctions because the medications are too expensive uh, because of misinformation so it's a whole overhaul and trying to really engage people living with diabetes people who are even scared to admit they have diabetes it because accepting um your reality sometimes is part of um actually taking the change making the change that you need to make um so yeah i think um also uniting our efforts as people um working in the diabetes space is also very important because that's how you know you you'll really create a supportive system because um when you advocate in as as, as a lone person it's very tiring it's very um, it's very, it's, and it's not motivating, you know, but when you have a team of very engaged people wanting to, you know, make change, create change, and you're working on it together, then each of you really adds energy and, 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 and we learn from each other and it becomes quite an interesting space to work in. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm getting messages that we are running short of time and, um, I would like to check if we have time to collect any further comments, perhaps, or whether the uh, co-chairs would like us to revert to them. Uh, Nupur ti uh, Tiara, can we continue or would you like to, uh, us to close our panel? We can continue um, very briefly with um, Gampo and Kashik. Yeah, thank you so much. Maybe if we move uh, uh, Gampo, uh, a sentence, a couple of sentences, anything that you want to add that's not been covered because we are short of time now. Yes, Jill, thank you. Um, moving forward and some of the solutions I think is uh, from the regional office uh, in Southeast Asia region, we, um, I, would, I would work with my director to create the same level of enthusiasm and understanding among our uh, focal points at the ministries of health to unpack the global diabetes compact. And uh, we could uh, create a regional mechanism. Uh, this is one immediate thing that we I feel as a solution. And the second is on the engagement of uh, people living with uh, diabetes and NCDs, we could, uh, we could network with the uh, CRNCD Alliance, which I think is a lot of opportunity to um, again uh, work together and see how we can create uh, provisions there to have uh, more regional engagement of uh, people living with diabetes and with lived experience. Thank you. Can I just check if Kashik wants to add a sentence? Yeah, yeah, Jill, just to tell you regarding the opportunities that I think as a member association, or if you look into the people with the disease, and if you look at people with diabetes, just to tell you about the opportunities that, for example, with the Tanzanian Diabetes Association, we have been able to work with the Ministry of Health, we have been able to basically put in an educate advocacy program, and we have started the national NCD program, which the implementing partner is the Tanzania Diabetes Association with the Tanzania NCD Alliance and working with the ministry and trying to set up the program within the public sector at the, at the secondary, tertiary and the primary levels. At the same time, empowering the people with the disease and get, getting peer educators who basically start working with the patients at, the, at these diabetes services and providing the training to the healthcare providers. So 
where you have a multi-stakeholder approach, whereby you are able to work with the ministries, you are able to work with the in infrastructure which is already existing, I think it becomes much, much simpler to put, it, put in the programs, initiate the programs and make these programs sustainable. Because if there is no sustainability of the program, as soon as the donor funding ends, the program tends to die out. So it is always better to work. It takes its own time to sensitize the ministry. It takes its time to do adequate advocacy with the powers to be. But then once your advocacy does work, then the programs become sustainable and they work over a longer period of time. Thank you so much. And thank you to the whole panel. We've had some really great ideas. We've gone from very small initiatives with individuals in the community all the way up to how we could change things at the regional level and across multiple countries. So thank you so much for your ideas, your commitment uh, and your passion in your answers. I, I'm very conscious of the time, so I will pass back to um, our co-chairs. Thank you and thanks to the panel. Thank you, Jill and our panelists for that great discussion. And believe it or not, everyone, we are coming on to our next and final panel. And this discussion centers advocacy and education, addressing stigma and other barriers. And the, the moderator for this discussion will be Ms. Johanna Ralston from the World Obesity Federation here in the United States. Johanna, over to you. Thank you so much, Tara. And thank you to all of our fantastic speakers, to Excellencies Ministers of Health, Dr. Tedros, uh, Dr. Axelrod and Nicholson and, and Bonus for your fantastic um, support in organizing this as well as the government of Canada. And we're really um, delighted to be here today uh, for what will be the final uh, of this incredibly uh, exciting um, and transformative set of panels. Um, also, I should add Ramadan Karim to our colleagues from all around the world. Today, we're going to be speaking um, to uh, advocacy and education, particularly to overcome stigma and misconceptions around um, diabetes. So um, I am, as, as uh, Tara said, I'm the um, Johanna Ralston. I'm CEO of the World Obesity Federation, and I've been working in um, NCDs for 25 years in early days of NCD Alliance and World Heart Federation and others. Um, but more specifically, I'm also a person living with NCDs for 30 years. Um, I've been in remission, thankfully, from MS for 20 years, and I've also lived with cancer. So um, I am both a, a patient and a professional, like many of us around the table. Um, our interest in, um, as World Obesity Federation, is very much because obesity uh, shares uh, so many comorbidities with, with other diseases, and there's a huge correlation between diabetes and obesity. And we also share a target in the 2025 plan around a zero increase in prevalence of diabetes and obesity, which we, we know is, is a, a challenge. Um, so I guess I just wanted to make a quick observation before really getting to um, the meat of today's session, which is our fantastic panelist, which is that I think there's been, um, in my professional life and my life as a patient, it seems to me there's been two game-changing periods. And the first one was really when the NCD community formed around the four, initially the four main diseases, four risk factors. Uh, and that's was interestingly enough led a lot by diabetes when with the diabetes resolution in the mid 2000s, which then sort of uh, paved the way for the, um, the start of the NCD Alliance, which I was part of and the, um, and the kind of global NCD movement. Um, and now I think diabetes is leading the way again um, by really placing people at the center in a way that I think it's really uh, is long overdue. Um, and I think we're all here because of that. Um, and I think you can, our passion is measurable and our effectiveness, um, if you match that passion with um, all that lies before us is, is, is beyond measure. So I think um, it's an exciting time to see this voice of lived experience. Um, if you don't take away anything else from today, or at least from what I'm saying, what Guy Fonis said that we have patient experts here is so important, that phrase patient experts, not patients as last minute invitees or tick a box, but patient experts around the table, nothing for us without us. And I do commend that report to you as well. It's fantastic. So um, without further ado, I'm just going to quickly introduce our brilliant speakers and then I will have a couple of questions and dialogues. So first, the person who I think has, has uh, had the most disruptive sleep in getting here <laughs> is uh, Ranjesh Abilia from um, Diabetes Australia, uh, living with type one diabetes, a professional who is also does a lot with language and stigma and is going to talk to us about that. And I do believe it's 
4.30 in the morning, if I'm not mistaken. So bravo. Renza, you uh, got up in the middle of the night to be here and um, have been here valiantly. We also have a patient advocate from Kuwait and the US, Alison Ibrahim, who is an educational consultant, patient advocate and speaker involved with World Obesity Federation, NCD Alliance and WHO and uh, a great uh, partner to all of our efforts. Uh, then it's Jean-Marie Dangou, who is a regional officer for Africa at the World Health Organization, lead, team lead of the um, NCD management, uh, NCD integration into uh, communicable and non-communicable disease management for the Afro region. Um, and a person I have had the privilege of working with for a number of years who uh, has been working in all 47 countries in the Afro region. And then finally, um, Emma Claitman, who is our global policy and advocacy manager for Life for a Child uh, UK, also an individual living with type one diabetes. So broadly, we are going to, um, would like to just um, ask the panel to each respond quite broadly to um, give, sharing your perspectives um, on, uh, on, on how lessons that you've learned regarding um, barriers to care, so sort of Perspectives and lessons learned on on, uh, on barriers to care, including stigma, for people with uh, diabetes, and how we might be able to um, overcome those. So, Renza, if we could start with you, um, recognizing that you are particularly focused on language and the importance of language, Renza. Thanks, Joanna. Um, before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land where I am. That's the Wurundjeri people, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging, and um, pay my respects to any Indigenous people watching today. Um, I am going to talk a little bit about language. I'm going to talk about um, how th that is just so important when it comes to communicating about um, diabetes and to people with diabetes. Um, I work for Diabetes Australia and we launched a position statement about this 10 years, uh, 10 years ago now. Um, but that wasn't the start of this conversation that came very much from the community. Um, and this is why it's so important to listen to people living with diabetes. We heard from the community that language is stigmatizing, it blames, it shames, it judges people. It means that people are likely to not want to seek care because they fear um, what, how they will be perceived. So we know that there certainly are um, specific words, specific ways that um, diabetes is spoken about that has in a lot of ways given diabetes, I guess, an image problem. And a great example of that is if we were to perhaps be in a cafe where there were three jars um, with three different charities for people to leave their loose change in, diabetes probably would be the one that the least, the fewest people actually donate to. People think that diabetes is brought on by ourselves, that it's laziness, that it's a condition that we deserve to get because we weren't active enough. Now, this is regardless if we're talking about type 1 or type 2 diabetes, there is huge stigma. Perhaps there is more stigma when it comes to type 2 diabetes because of the lifestyle implications that we hear so much about. And I really would like to challenge people when we just talk about that that um, that lifestyle factor when it comes to type 2 diabetes. So thinking about language is really important, um, but also remembering this isn't about tone policing the words that people with diabetes use. We can use whatever words we want to describe our condition. However, when we're looking at organisations, when we're looking at the media, when we're looking at health professionals and researchers, being really mindful of just how those words have so much impact is really critical in ensuring that people feel empowered rather than feeling stigmatised. Fantastic. That's incredibly helpful for um, for us, and it, it's very applicable to um, to other diseases that that we're all um, uh, grappling with as well. So thank you very much for that. Um, and next, we are going to hear from um, Alison Ibrahim, who will give her perspective as an advocate, and also perhaps allude to her recent experience of um, COVID in two different countries on two continents, and how that has actually even deepened her her understanding of, um, of the role of the uh, individual with lived experience. Allison. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much to the Global Diabetes Compact and to the World Health, or Health Organization for this wonderful opportunity and event. Um, I'm Allison Tennyson Ibrahim. I've been living in Kuwait for the last 28 years. I'm a Kuwaiti citizen and an African-American um, obviously a community that is also uh, very uh, underserved, and that would be both on the North American continent or many other places in the world, as well as the original continent. 
Um, I'd also like to recognize Ramadan myself um, as a Muslim and say Mubarak alaykum al shahar to all my brothers and sisters and to everyone for Ramadan, the original intermittent fasting. Um, as a retired educator and devoted patient advocate, um, I know that people living with diabetes may often have uh, comorbidities. And in my case, I have multiple. Um, as a person living with type two diabetes and as well as obesity hand in hand for nearly 20 years, I've lost 60 pounds and I'm then able to get a little bit of control into my health. Um, it's very encouraging though, to witness the growth of acknowledgement and to practice from the distinguished medical community. We need you with us. It's um, also people living with diabetes have life-saving information to share through experiences. Our voices when acknowledged will present opportunities um, for us all to directly participate in our health. Um, when we are more aware and share any understanding of diabetic markers, such as education on care and treatment, and equally as important caregiver training, which I more recently found out myself was life or death. I don't know much about insulin, but I had a father who was insulin dependent. So things like that and the learning opportunities are so important. With attention to areas such as association between type two diabetes, like Johanna was talking about and obesity, um, the positive impact of wider support through the effort or efforts of WHO uh, places in organizations like the World Obesity Federation, NCD Alliance, and the launch of this Global Diabetes Compact with the Global Diabetes Summit that we're all attending today with support from the governments, including Canada, who is our sponsor and as other governments that are here today, that we advocate, educate and train and empower in this way is life-changing. To establish relationships with our healthcare team will all gain medical realizations. Listening to our bodies offers opportunity to learn and with the onset of COVID-19, these past 16 months have been challenging at best. The need is strong for cooperation, equity, and access. Johanna mentioned to you about the fact that I've lived between two cultures and I'm here in the United States because I lost two family members over these last few months, not to COVID, but to NCDs. With that, I also had to get medical uh, insurance for myself. Coming from Kuwait, a country that is universal health care provided freely to all, including primary, secondary, and tertiary care, including medications and ongoing treatment, it was a shock to the system to come home. I pay $750 a month for medical insurance that covers me to a primary level, of which I've never seen the doctor since October, telemed. In Kuwait, I've seen the doctor at least a dozen times during the pandemic. These opportunities make or break a healthcare, uh, healthcare for, for an individual or people living with diabetes. We have to become more interested in opportunities for global alignment and joint advocacy to focus on methods of building back better. These experiences that I'm having are real and I need help. And we can't do it alone and we aren't getting very far without support. Um, I just wanna also say that um, the building this bridge between what WHO is offering us with the Global Diabetes Compact and bringing in people living with diabetes as voices for their own care and attention is monumental. And I can't thank you enough for that. And I wish you all wonderful, wonderful rest of the summit and I look forward to talking to all of you and again in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Allison. Excellent. And now it's uh, my great privilege to present Dr. Jean-Marie Dangou, who will speak about um, some of the myths and misperceptions with a particular focus on, uh, on uh, type 1 diabetes um, through his work in, in many countries in Africa. Jean-Marie. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joanna. I'm very honored and pleased to be part of this uh, conversation on diabetes. Uh, sharing the perspectives and lessons from the African region, I will start, as you rightly said, by type 1 diabetes, and I will expand a bit to all forms of diabetes. So with type 1 diabetes, the stigma is twofold. We all know about it. 
as in, in, it, it involves uh, children, but also the parents who out of lack of awareness occasionally pass blame and miss an opportunity to stand with the child and support them in the journey. We have identified three pillars making the foundation of the stigma in type one diabetes. First, it's a high level of an awareness of the teaching and, and uh, school staff on diabetes. We saw lack of support and a lot of injection related stigma in schools as it's sometimes confused with injecting drugs. In boarding schools, injections are done in hiding by the patients. The second pillar we identified here in the region is huge treatment gaps with poor access and sustainable supply of insulin. The unavailable necessary cold chain and blood glucose testing capacity results in an in and out uh, of hospital patterns for the child that further fuels the stigma. And the third one is about myth and misconception about the origin of type one diabetes about and in Africa, most border on witchcraft, spiritual connection and bad omen, all which fuel stigma uh, to type one diabetes. These myths and misconception about diabetes foster and sustain stigma and blame that eventually affect the self-esteem of the child leading to failure to thrive. Most broadly, to help with understanding of stigma and discrimination in people living with diabetes, regardless of the type of diabetes, as well as thinking through uh, where and what the interventions, the uh, advocacy and education interventions could be, various dimensions were observed. I will cite two of them. The first one is the socio-ecological dimension which includes four components, the public policy, such as national and local laws and policies that could be drivers or discriminating practices, or that could be facilitators of anti-discrimination. The second component is organizational factors, including organizations themselves, social institutions, workplace. The third one is community factors, which includes cultural values, norms, attitudes in the community, but also interpersonal factors which relate to family, friends, social networks. And the last one is individual factors uh, uh, in line with the knowledge of the patient, attitudes, and skills. So that's the perspective and lessons I would like to share with regard to what's happening in our region. Advocacy and uh, education to take into consideration the pillars uh, making the foundation of stigma, but also the two dimensions I described. Over back to you, Joanne. Thank you so much, very helpful. Okay, and now finally, last but not least, we are going to speak with Emma. And if you could just um, broadly speak about um, unique perspectives and lessons learned, and, uh, and also within your experience with um, type one diabetes, how do you ensure a strong narrative with the best possible evidence? Um, so you can address differences in commonalities and commonalities between type one and type two. And what are some of those challenges in translating those messages at the grassroots versus global level? So um, sort of a couple of different questions. Mm -hmm. we'll sure. here. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna. Um, firstly, I would just like to say that this is indeed a great honor to share this space with fellow advocates and practitioners, having just marked 23 years of having type one myself. And to follow on from Jean-Marie's focus, Life for a Child's work and activism has centered around creating evidence-backed advocacy for increased provision of diabetes care in less resource countries. And for young people in these contexts, they struggle to access even the most basic components of care. And when the struggle is present, and it is far too present, they risk developing dangerous and premature acute complications and chronic ones too. 
These are ones that obstruct them from thriving. These are ones that prevent them obtaining the basic human rights of leading safe and healthy lives. These are ones that even in some cases prevent them from living. These are avoidable risks. These avoidable risks can be in part linked to a lack of evidence on the true number of young people living with diabetes, mortality and morbidity estimates, cost-effective interventions, and how lack of access to care plays out in terms of health outcomes. The lack of data in this area has consequences, and these consequences put roadblocks in the way of making change for young people who currently face unaffordable access to the diabetes care they need. I mean, I think in other words, nothing can be changed until it is faced. And that is where life for a child adds advocacy value by helping to craft evidence for use within local settings. We've carried out epidemiological data on incidents and prevalence of diabetes in youth, most recently in Bangladesh and Eritrea, and published studies that show really that intermediate levels of type one diabetes care are indeed cost effective as per WHO choice in six countries, including Azerbaijan, Bolivia, Mali, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and Tanzania. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emma. So that was a really interesting range of, of discussion of, of, of interventions ranging from Renza's around language narrative and, and uh, some, of the, um, some of the discrimination that occurs there, Allison's lived experience and also perspective um, working uh, in, a, in a country with UHC in a country without universal health coverage. Emma, really, really useful to hear um, that sort of the role stigma is playing um, among young people, but also how you weave a common narrative. And thank you, Jean-Marie, for um, really highlighting the role of parents, um, which I think is, has probably, um, and, and caregivers as well, we could, we could um, extrapolate um, and looking um, in particular, just how do we how do we get over some myths? How do we understand the context a bit better? I think it's enormously valuable. So we have one final round of quick questions for, which is really what would be one recommendation you'd make moving forward uh, around this broad issue of addressing stigma and other barriers, um, overcoming those. So I'm going to go in the same order again, if if I may, and say Renzo, what would you be your one recommendation? So we're focus, focusing on language. Um, there is so much out there. So I feel that, you know, it's really important that we can provide some solutions here. Um, there are language position statements that have been developed um, around the world now. So finding those and using those as a very simple guide that um, organisations can use, individuals can use. Um, if, you're, if you're a person with diabetes and you're being interviewed in the media, have a copy of that to give to the journalist. Um, and, and insist that they use words that are not stigmatizing, that they don't paint you as a victim, that, that they use words that are empowering. It's actually, it doesn't need to be all that difficult. There are ways that we can make these small changes and that's how we can really change that perception of diabetes and start to reduce that stigma on a broader scale. So that's just a really quick, but quite simple tip. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Alison, what would be your one recommendation? Um, my one recommendation would be that we could start focusing a little bit on lifestyle as well, if we're going to talk about advocating for education and training, that incorporating like behavioral interventions such as self-monitoring, self-motivating, self-kindness, keeping a positive focus and outlook to keep and share empowering messages as ways of uh, uh, helping to build up um, people living with diabetes and focus on themselves, listening to the doctor, following medications, limiting stress, fear, and anxiety. I know that's very difficult during these days and times. We, we try to find the best ways we can. And that's, that's it. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, Jamali. Uh, thank you, Joanna. Allow me to make two points. The first one is about health promotion on diabetes. Uh, Health promotion on diabetes, if holistic, is all rounded and can serve as an entry point into promoting wellness in the entire life cycle continuum and in management of NCDs and infectious disease alike. We should use information technology to support health literacy and diabetic patient empowerment. We should develop incentive for diabetic patients, education, prevention, early detection, and lifestyle change. 
My second point is about key success to the, to the compact. It will be alignment and united action across the public, private, and philanthropic sectors with a deliberate attempt to meaningfully involve people living, living with diabetes in policy deliberation and advocacy, operational arrangements which drive results, government transparency, and accountability. Thank you. Great, wonderful. Thank you so much. And Emma, what would be your one recommendation? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Joanna. Um, so I'm a person living with type 1 diabetes, but I'm also a professional skilled in public health, health economics, and data. So I suppose it might be easy to look at me and think, oh, of course she can speak on this. She's a professional. But I really want to instill that the bedrock of my skill set is having diabetes. And, mm -hmm. you know, in, think about, in thinking about balancing strong narratives as agents for change, my message is this, advocates should not be afraid to step outside of their traditional lanes. They should know that they are allowed and encouraged to bring data and advocacy into evidence-based approaches. I really think that, I think we can all agree having diabetes is a prerequisite enough. And I think just finally, I think the hard work really does begin when we think about implementing these evidence-based tools to drive change. And we should be encouraging a melting pot of on the ground implementers to carry these messages through to local lawmakers. So really the recommendation I have is to have a rethink about our lanes so that trailblazing local advocates are able to understand and disseminate what may have been told to them as being too high level. You know, advocates have power to change the game in their settings and country leaders, they listen to them. And when country leaders are aware of the true number of children and young people needing to be forecasted for, and that more of them are dying than they think, and that those surviving struggle still to access basic diabetes care, how could action not be driven? Thank you. Thank you. So I think just to summarize, first of all, just thank you to such a fantastic panel. And um, just to summarize, I think the, 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 the recommendations are again, languages. I would add, suggest by adding images too. I think the pictures that we use of people uh, have a huge um, influence as well. Um, and there was a very interesting correlation between lifestyle and um, and sort of life course the, between Jean-Marie and, and, and Allison in terms of the individual as an agent of, of change and, the, and, 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 the, and diabetes as an entry point to a holistic NCD approach. Um, and of course, Emma speaking about to the patient expert point, completely agree. The reason I consider myself an expert is because of not all the years I've worked or studied, but lived at living with NCDs has is, is been my experience. And I think all of you living with all the people here who are living with or affected by diabetes are the, uh, the true uh, vital voices at the, at the center of this table. Um, so with that, I think we wanna just thank you, celebrate um, the Global Diabetes Compact, celebrate this increased motivation, thank the diabetes community for once again, leading the way for, um, and, and saying, you know, we're not, we're not gonna come to these meetings 10 years from now and say we need to be more like HIV and community and, and have strong patients. We are the people living with, we are the people who can drive this, alongside our friends, colleagues, allies in WHO, in all the different sectors. So I just want to uh, reiterate that this is a shared effort um, and this is an exciting moment. Uh, and with that, I wanna thank WHO very much for inviting us as well. Um, and I'm ready to, uh, to turn this over then. Thanks. The Tara? Thanks, okay. <laughs> Um, so our fourth and final panel for today was a very rich and interesting discussion moderated expertly by Johanna and our panelist Renza, who incidentally is celebrating her 23rd diabetes anniversary today, Alison, who shared her experiences about the healthcare system across continents as a person with diabetes and a caregiver, Jean-Marie, who, who touched upon stigma, and Emma, who spoke about access and costs in low and middle income countries. Now, as we draw to the end of this wonderful segment from today's Global Diabetes Summit, it is my pleasure to introduce the Deputy Director General of the WHO, Dr. Susanna Jacob, to share her closing remarks.
The 100th anniversary of the discovery of insulin is a painful reminder that one-third of people in need around the world still cannot get access to insulin. At the same time, this occasion presents a window of opportunity to invigorate new and meaningful partnerships and collaborations to bring diabetes care and medicines to all who need it. People living with diabetes must be able to enjoy their rights as equal citizens in every country. Global citizenship confers rights on each of us to have equal access to essential services such as diabetes care, testing and medicines. Universal health coverage should become the foundation of the right to access health. Through the Global Diabetes Compact, WHO will seek to mobilize partners to propose global coverage targets for diabetes to the World Health Assembly, WHO's final decision-making body. With the current COVID-19 pandemic and more individuals paying attention to the Global Health Agenda, together we have an opportunity to be ambitious. Fundamentally, where people and communities living with and affected by diabetes should be further engaged in decision-making and diabetes service delivery, more people living with diabetes gain access to treatment and more undiagnosed people are tested. This co-creation of solutions will build a community that will walk the talk of action on diabetes together with us. We welcome your insights on shaping global guidelines for engagement that persons living with diabetes and other stakeholders can adapt to strengthen the governance of the compact at regional, national, and local levels. We hear your calls to fully embed and advocacy. Commitment from all partners, backed by a rigorous data-driven approach, is essential in achieving this goal. You have shown us that your actions encourage governments to develop ambitious national diabetes responses. Your involvement changes the language around diabetes, reduces stigma, and focuses on the commonalities between type 1 and type 2 diabetes, while at the same time acknowledging the nuances. We acknowledge the need to develop better educational and health literacy tools for people living with diabetes, their families and communities that can be adapted across cultures and contexts. We want to ensure you to feel part of what we aim to achieve with the Global Diabetes Compact, ensuring that people with lived experiences own the past, present, and the future. Together, 2021 can be the year to build a global coalition for bringing diabetes care to all who need it and begin building a truly inclusive approach to supporting people living with diabetes around the world. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Director General. And now I have the pleasure of reintroducing Dr. Svetlana Axelrod and also Dr. Benty Melkinson to provide further closing remarks. Thank you very much. Really fantastic discussion and a lot of 
new opportunities for us, new future steps that we have to be going on. And uh, I really want to thank all the participants, especially our co-chairs, moderators of all the panels, and of course the panelists themselves uh, for this very interesting discussion. And we view from the different angles how it is important uh, to support people living with diabetes and how we should work more closely uh, and work more closely with the member states to support them in their activities to uh, fight against the diabetes to find to beat NCDs. So I'm really excited of this uh, fantastic meeting. The first uh, segment was a high level, but the second segment was also very, very important because we've got this interactive discussion when we've got these uh, new uh, thoughts, new experience, how we should work on it and how we should uh, uh, make our future development on the diabetes and uh, what we can do. So really, I'm very excited. Thank you very much, all the colleagues and uh, from the WHO and all uh, panelists and uh, moderators for this productive discussion. I just want to highlight maybe a couple of th thoughts that was already mentioned by uh, Deputy Director General Susanna Jakob uh, in her final words. And uh, maybe just to say that we are just in the middle of uh, our way and we should uh, join all our uh, capacities to do more work to support the countries, to support the communities, to support the people who are living with densities. And of course, we will do all our best to make this successful. So uh, that, is, that is our future. And uh, of course, it's uh, very important that we will collaborate in different platforms. And of course, we want to engage young people to do this work. We want to engage also the people who are living with diabetes. And of course, we want to engage all civil society uh, to be the part of this discussion. I don't want to speak too much because it is a late time for, for Geneva and it will be followed by the third segment. I want now maybe to ask my colleague, Benta Mikkelsen, and also to say thank you very much, Benta, for this uh, fantastic meeting that you uh, give us the opportunity to, to join uh, me as a director of the Global Entity Platform. Uh, and thanks uh, once again for this uh, productive and fruitful discussion. Over to you, Benta. Thank you very much. And what a day and what a segment. So uh, it's such an honor to be leading the WHO Global Diabetes Compact together with all of you. This is really a co-leadership. And I load when some of you, several of you actually said, this is a game changer. So I just want to bring us a little bit back. So of course, we do this in the context of COVID-19 pandemic, and it is an unprecedented effort to mobilize resources and political will to meet the health needs of people living with NCD. So the tragedy has also become an opportunity. And since the pandemic, we must realize, and I think more and more leaders of uh, governments, heads of states and governments see that people living with diabetes have been among the most affected of the COVID situation. And the crisis is far from over. Indeed, the speed of the infection is now even increasing. So the COVID-19 pandemic is our most immediate challenge but we cannot ignore the significant fragilities that has been highlighted, especially for people living with diabetes. For many small island development states and least developed countries, the effects of diabetes are deadly reality already, as we have heard today from many of you and also from the heads of state speaking before. 
So we need to really learn now. We need to learn very fast and we need to reverse this dangerous trend. And that is why we launched the Global Diabetes Compact today. So the increasing premature mortality, the lack of access to medicines and technology, the COVID-19 and the 100 years of insulin. So it's a once in a generation opportunity for bundling bold and creative diabetes solution. So that's why I'm so happy that you, all of you, and many, many more people around the planet know are willing to be co-leaders, co-create solution and bundling solutions already existing. And I think we don't need to be afraid to put multilateralism to the test. I mean, the reason why so many heads of states and ministers actually joined us today is a proof of that. So we need to issue a call in May 2021 for really a multi-million commitments to be delivered each year to include NCD into UHC and primary health care. So together with you and together with all that has been on the journey so far, experts, uh, colleagues all over the globe, like we have seen today from the regions, from the countries, from, from the colleagues working on medicines and technology, health systems, and, uh, and also uh, communication, which is important. We have seen and we have uh, listened and the, 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 the way we have listened is also no sort of materializing into eight asks for all those who want to join the compact. So the first act is to unite, and you have spoken to it today. Collaboratively uh, unite stakeholders, include people with living with diabetes around a common agenda and scale up advocacy. Advocacy is important. Also to integrate, integrate diabetes prevention and management into uh, primary health care and UHC, and also to triple country support. Innovate. We need to close the research and, and normative gaps and we need to spur innovation. We had people online today who stand ready to help and support with innovations. We need to treat, and many of you have mentioned the importance of coverage targets. We are working on that now. We are also working on global price tags. We need to be sure that we improve access to diabetes, diagnostics, medicines, health products, and especially insulin in low and middle income countries. The fifth ask is to track. We need data. We need to develop the coverage targets and track them. We need to establish a basis for accountability and also to be able to trace and improve. We need funds to improve. We need to educate. And I have listened to you through all both the three days of consultation, which was really for me a game changer. And also today to promote health literacy and education. And the last one is power ahead build back better based on the experience from the COVID-19 pandemic and the need to build preparedness and social security. We need to be prepared for the next pandemic, but even more important, we need to change so that people are living with diabetes and are at risk for diabetes, can thrive and live healthy and prosperous life. So thank you so much for being part of this journey, being part of this solution seeking endeavor. Thank you so much. Back to the co-chairs, I guess. Thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. Mickelson, and uh, thank you, Dr. Axelrod, for your thoughts and uh, for creating and leading the Global Diabetes Compact along with people living with diabetes. I'd now like to call upon our three keynote listeners for today. Um, in order, Sana Ajmal from Niti Zindagi, Pakistan, followed by um, Lion Osarenko from the IDF Nigeria, and Minister Clara Morin Dalkol from the, um, she's the Minister of Health from the Metis National Council. Over to you, Sana. Thank you, Chiara and Nupur and WHO for giving me this chance. Uh, it is such an honor to be here today. And uh, wow, how does one go after Bente? 
Um, my heartfelt congratulations to WHO and to Bente's team for the incredible work that they have done. Uh, Ramadan Karim to all Muslims and a very happy diversity to Renza. So today is definitely a day of celebration. And let me be clear why. Today is not a day of celebration because insulin was discovered 100 years ago. Because when we think about that, it becomes a day of painful reflection. Hundreds of thousands of us around the world still cannot access it. To today is a day of celebration because of WHO's commitment to change the way we have been handling diabetes healthcare. Today is the day when after a decade of tireless advocacy, I see an important stakeholder, the WHO, moving away from tokenism and listening to our lived experience and promising purposeful, inclusive, transformative, and proactive engagement. So what are the key takeaways uh, for me from today's discussion? I'll, I'll begin with what I've seen in Pakistan. So Pakistan is a country where the gap between those who can afford and those who cannot is huge. Starting with loss of a work day to visit a public sector hospital every month, to the travel costs involved, to the lack of tra uh, trained healthcare professionals and to the out-of-pocket costs for insulin and dress trips being unaffordable for so many. Or you may be just required to make do with whatever insulin is available for free, whether it suits you or not, to there being no resources in the multiple languages spoken in the country, to the complete lack of empathy and awareness where people who are poverty stricken even find it hard to get charitable donations because of the concept that diabetes is self-inflicted or that diabetes care is a person's own responsibility. Let me remind you, Pakistan is one of the top 10 countries where charity takes place. These are only some of the huge gaps that need filling where we're trying to bring a change through use of technology. So one can't even begin to understand the widespread issues, a landscape of which was very beautifully painted by Crystal by only looking at the high level data alone. It's so important to put the data in perspective of the lived experience to actually hear the data speak. And I'm so sure that every country has its own different challenges, but there's a lot in common too. And only with a diverse but united group of people living with diabetes from around the world as partners can we actually address these challenges globally as well as locally. So changing the narrative is the key takeaway because that changes everything. Valuing people with diabetes as experts and not only seeing them as patients, starting with involving us in decisions about our care in co-design, development, implementation and governance to ensure equitable access, uh, equitable and accessible care uh, this is the game changer. Who can put the needs of people living with diabetes better at the decision table than people living with diabetes themselves? And not only this, but speaking about us and making sure that all materials and communication are in the right, non-discriminatory, non-judgmental language. So to end it up, advocacy has its exhaustion effect and we were getting impatient of waiting. WHO has promised us a game changer and re-energized us. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, WHO. This is amazing. And uh, I want to say thank you. Uh, I feel honored. I feel blessed that in my lifetime, I see a change. A change happen while I'm still alive, not just in my children's time. Because uh, coming from where the country where I am in Nigeria, this is uh, it's a miracle, it's a prayer answer to a lot of us. Uh, listening to all the, the head of states, the ministers speak today, I am overwhelmed and, I'm, and I'm, I feel and I strongly feel that 2021 is a year of a positive change in the lives of persons living with diabetes from what I saw and what I had and what we have agreed. Uh, from all the discussion that's happened here today and all the, all the uh, uh, presentation done from the first segment to this very sec second segment, I, I feel that today is a, is a history-making day because we all have become one family. We have one common problem, which is diabetes, and we have agreed today to make a positive change. And it's very simple. And we decide to change the narrative, getting the, 
the people who are living with diabetes like me, who has been with them with type two, get stationary first and then change it. Uh, we all have spoken and we all have contributed so much, but no one spoke about gestational, which is really the real reason why most of us are here. Um, a gestational diabetes really need to be captured along with all the solution that is being provided here. Primary health care, primary health care is what all the leaders spoke about. That's where they started from. That's where the change started from. Primary health care is what most people are suggesting. And that is what I think is, I'm also suggesting, I'm going to take back to my government, that we should, uh, we should insist that this global diabetes compact that we have launched today is carried from, we, through, the, through the, uh, the eye and the voice of those living with it. And I want to thank everyone, the first panel, the second panel, also the governance, everyone contributed so much. And I want to also advise that uh, you had to look into those who already have a success rate, uh, like in, in uh, Singapore, in, uh, uh, in UK, uh, in, uh, um, in, in Kenya, they've already implemented some successful methods that maybe we copy that and, 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 and um, use that as, a, as, a, as a, a guide to the rest of countries who have not started anything yet. But in my country, my president is not here. We have 150 million. Uh, I, I, I know Nigerians are all over the world and we are affected by diabetes nearly. I lost quite a number of persons in this COVID and all due to diabetes. So I would want and I would plead that this particular, uh, 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 this uh, diabetes compound that we launched today is enforced on, on government. I don't know, not by force, but it's made sure that it is, it is embraced by government who agreed and monitored, not just like we did with the HIV. We wouldn't want it to go that way. The HIV was really mismanaged by some developing countries like mine. I know the success rate is good, but it could have been better. Diabetes shouldn't be run that way. Like we have started well involving persons living with it, but it should be monitored. It should be guided. It should be, there should be accountability by the government. So I will want to say thank you to WHO and Vende, uh, Vende. Dr. Vende, you are amazing. You, you make me feel, feel blessed each time I hear you talk. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, my family. Thank you, my family. Because we, we, I feel we are related. I feel connected. I feel blessed. And I want to thank all the government who have already implemented something uh, on ground that uh, I would, I am making a plea that I'm going to make a positive change towards my government in doing something about diabetes, whether they like it or not, <laughs> because I have you on my back. Thank you all very much. God bless you. Greetings. I don't know if you can hear me or not. You can? We can okay, hear thank you. you. Okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, to provide some remarks with the representatives of Pakistan and Nigeria at this Global Diabetes Summit. I'd also like to join with others in applauding the World Health Organization and the Government of Canada for organizing and co-hosting this conference on the 100th anniversary of the discovery of insulin here in Canada. I'm speaking on behalf of the Métis National Council as my capacity as Minister of Health of the Métis National Council. Let me take a moment to provide a brief background on the Métis people in Canada. The Métis Nation are a distinct Indigenous people as defined in Section 35 of the Canadian Constitution. The Métis Nation emerged with its own collective identity, language, culture, way of life, and self-government in the historic Northwest prior to Canada's westward expansion following Confederation. 
Today, there are more than 420,000 Métis people in Canada. Regarding takeaways from here, we have heard in this segment many experiences from different individuals living with diabetes in different parts of the world. Meaningful engagement with communities and education is fundamental to reduce diabetes in the world. It should start with a better understanding and respect of people's self-determination, culture, history, and governance. Lyle Daniels of the National Indigenous Diabetes Association here in Canada talked about the need to help our young people, both pre-diabetic and diabetic, and that education is so important. I couldn't agree more because they are our future generations and we have to do everything we can to ensure they are aware of how to help avoid diabetes and we need different tools to reach our young people. Young Canadians have a 50% 50 50 chance of developing diabetes and you can be assured that the percentage of young indigenous people is even higher. That has to be our priority. In addition, collaborative and creative partnerships with communities are needed to identify respectful and culturally competent research strategies and health interventions to decrease existing diabetes rates among diverse populations around the world. Diabetes and chronic Diseases share common risk factors and conditions, including economic and physical conditions that influence and shape behavior. In terms of engagement and experience, Métis people believe that in order to properly meet their unique healthcare needs, major structural changes must be made to the design and delivery of existing healthcare approaches. Increased Métis Nation involvement in the health and wellness area will ensure the provisions of culturally grounded and holistic well-being approaches to health. Thus, all parties believe that a forward-looking agenda on prevention and health promotion has the potential to achieve long-term transformative changes to the health conditions of Métis. Finally, I thank you again for the opportunity to participate in this event. Merci and thank you. Thank you to our wonderful keynote speakers for your closing remarks. I want to invite Heather Koga back up here. Um, earlier we had some technical difficulties and Heather is gonna give her recap on the people living with diabetes informal consultation from last month. Heather? Uh, hello? Yeah, there you have four. Okay, thank you. Uh, my connection, uh, I had some connectivity challenges there, but I'm back now. I thank you for this opportunity. Um, I was part of the uh, consultation for people living with diabetes, and I am glad uh, to say that um, it was a very uh, deep and insightful um conference, we had uh, so many discussions. And um, I am happy that most of the things uh, that we discussed and uh, agreed on were also echoed um, in this discussion today. Um, just a few uh, takeaways. Uh, we discussed the issue of uh, the availability uh, and affordability of insulin. And we noted that uh, insulin is not available to most people with type 1 diabetes, as well as um, to over half of the people with type 2 diabetes who need it. So the resolution was that there is still a lot of um, advocacy that needs to be done in that area. We need to make sure that um, issues of affordability and accessibility are addressed and that um, 
issues of research and innovation are also uh, addressed and discussed. Uh, we also had issues to do with discrimination and uh, this discrimination, the emphasis was on type two diabetes uh, because most of the time uh, type two diabetes uh, is the cause of factors are uh, related to lifestyle uh, choices. So that is where the root of the discrimination. And we agreed that uh, most um, healthcare practitioners and uh, even um, journalists, the media, and the general public, there's still a lot of education that need to go around for us to be able to address uh, that stigma and discrimination. And then um, also issues to do with the type of advocacy strategies that we need to employ uh, in order to uh, keep um, speaking for people with diabetes. And um, high level advocacy was highly um, encouraged. Uh, the type of advocacy where people with diabetes um, engage policymakers, engage government officials, and advocate on, on high levels. Uh, so most of all, I would like to thank the WHO for giving us the platform, people living with diabetes. It is good that we can come together and uh, be able to, to have a say and to have an influence on the decisions that affect us. And um, I can say that previously we were always on the menu, we were always discussed, but now we are also on the table partaking of that menu. So I thank the WHO and I hope that they will keep providing platforms for people with diabetes to be able to come up uh, together and to discuss issues uh, that affect them. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Heather, for sharing your perspective from last month's consultation. Everyone, I hope that you've been inspired by today's conversations and by all of our speakers. To all of our speakers, thank you so much for participating today. All of you have illustrated beautifully why the lived experiences of people with diabetes matter for the Global Diabetes Compact. And this is a tremendous initiative to improve access and care for people with diabetes around the globe. Some of the takeaways that I've gotten from today's discussions include, of course, not tokenizing people with diabetes, going from mere storytelling to including us in the formation of regional specific frameworks, addressing stigma, especially against people with type two diabetes, and also addressing the use of language as Renza mentioned earlier, the importance of widening access to diabetes education and meeting people with limited resources where they are, as Crystal mentioned earlier. And I would also like to echo something that Lau mentioned in our first panel today, which is why it's important to make sure that First Nation and Indigenous individuals, individuals with diabetes who are often overlooked in discussions about diabetes to be represented well in this compact. So um, as we move forward with next steps, we also have to remember that indigenous people really need that kind of representation in this group. As well as providing advocacy training for people living with diabetes. There are so many advocates, whether online or offline, who are very interested in sharing their voices but need help on how to do that. And we can give that kind of training to make sure that they can have an impact at all levels of society. Finally, alongside Nepur, it has been a pleasure and an honor to co-chair this event. I'm very much looking forward to the action and next steps that the Global um, Compact, Diabetes Compact takes. And I'll kick it over to my co-chair, my co Nepur, for, um, for the last remarks. Thanks, Tiara. In my really quick thank you list, I'd like to thank the government of Canada and the World Health Organization for inviting us to co-create the Global Diabetes Compact. We're going to be the change together. I echo Johanna when she said, diabetes is leading the way again. I'd like to thank my wonderful co-host today, Tiara, from across the globe. And thank you to all our speakers and all our participants. Your passion really shone through in in what you spoke. 
Thank you to all our viewers as well for joining this segment. And a quick reminder, the third segment for people living with diabetes, which is 100 years of insulin, celebrating its impact on our lives, organized by the University of Toronto, can be accessed through the registration link in the description box of this YouTube channel. Thank you once again and have a good day ahead.